well. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Massimo Morelli speak about mediation and peace. So the Massimo, the floor is yours. Very good. Thank you very much for um, inviting me here. It's a great, inspiring conference. Um, so this paper is joined with uh, Johannes Horner and uh, Francesco Squintani, who previously had um, have already written before this uh, a paper on uh, arbitration and other other forms of uh, uh, negotiations, how to contrast them. And as you will see, uh, what we do here is uh, add uh, one element of this debate on on whether. Um, one type or another of negotiation or arbitration or mediation is good or bad, that is relevant for international relations. So in a sense, this paper that we do is in the direction of bringing mechanism design towards international relations in a couple of senses that we talk about pretty soon. So introduction. Uh, mechanism design uh, ought to be useful uh, in uh, international relations, according to us, because uh, there are many potential ways to uh, structure conflict resolution or many potential ways in which uh, you can uh, make, uh, ask people to, to negotiate. Of course, they are free to disagree with uh, the way you, 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 you try to structure their, their, their negotiations or their, their procedure, but at least uh, there are many, many different ways that you can suggest, many different things that you can suggest. And in particular, uh, working out the optimal communication mechanism under different circumstances um, can help to uh, talk about, to give some normative benchmark, once again, using the language of, uh, of Sandeep, about what type of, na what the nature, the strength, and the form of, uh, of third party intervention that, for example, the UN should advocate. Um, in particular, under what circumstances would you want uh, to have a third party intervene at all and, and to do what? Would you want uh, just uh, uh, a mediator that uh, helps with communication in one way or another? Or, do you, or, or would it be desirable that the mediator also has some enforcement power and commitment power? Um, and, and why would the mediator and under what circumstances would the mediator uh, strictly improve welfare with respect to letting the players negotiate by themselves with uh, cheap talk, direct communication. So those are the questions we are interested in. And uh, um, as the final bullet suggests, this slide, the, the, the one thing that we have to uh, introduce in order to, to bring this discussion uh, towards usefulness, I mean, not, not that it's uh, uh, in international relations is to uh, acknowledge that uh, countries are sovereign and you can't really force them uh, uh, to do what the mechanism uh, is, is, is suggesting. So you have to impose ex post individual rationality and incentive compatibility of the IC star type, which we'll talk about in a minute what it means. Namely, uh, you have to even allow that, uh, that, uh, one, that off the equilibrium path when people uh, de deviate from truth telling, uh, they are actually considering the ex post IR constraints in, in, in what follows. Okay, so, so ex post individual rationality means uh, you can't, it is related to the idea that you can't really force uh, uh, countries to do, uh, to do something because the third party doesn't usually have enforcement power of a, of a strong type. Okay, so the bench, the normative benchmark we will. Uh, uh, offer in this paper is about pure mediation. Pure mediation uh, in the in the literature of mediation is one ex at, at one extreme, uh, following what uh, uh, Tawel and, and Zartman use us to, to define it. Um, we are basically uh, letting the mediator uh, free to um, uh, formulate proposals, um, facilitate communication, and uh, Manipulate information. Those are things that are fair game for the for the mediator. But the mediator has no enforcement power, has no uh, potential subsidies or transfers that he could offer to the players in order to achieve peaceful outcomes, and has no extra information that he could uh, um, use in the negotiation process to help one count, uh, country or player uh, accept a settlement or something else. 
So, so we could also think of the mediator having a different objective function, such as the welfare of the parties he's mediating. For. Yes. So that's why I'm reserving the 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 first bullet of this slide as last in what I'm just uh, just saying. I, I went kind of backwards from bottom up because the impartiality that we assume, namely that the mediator is. Uh, um, uh, is simply minimizing, and the, the objective function of the mediator is the neutral one the, to minimize the probability of war, ex ante. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, not necessary for most of the things, for the structure of our, of our, of our um, um, uh, for the mechanisms, but it is the most consistent one, precisely because if you, if you read the literature on uh, the value of partiality versus impartiality, biasness versus unbiased, whatever, uh, the, the pros and cons are always related to the credibility that the mediator may have or may not have, depending on this bias, in, trans in, uh, uh, in uh, giving information to the players. But in this model, the information that the mediator has is only the information that comes from the players. And so it, uh, it turns out, even though we don't have uh, as, you know, an interest in, in proving it uh, explicitly, that in fact uh, impartiality uh, uh, makes sense and we conjecture would, would uh, if, we, if we addressed the debate between Rauchos and Kidd and others on whether uh, uh, the bias is good or bad, my, our conjecture is that this would be indeed a context in which impartiality would be bad. Okay? But we haven't, we haven't fully ask the question, do you want an impartial mediator or not? Okay, but the, the, it makes sense given that he has no information and we conjecture that it is indeed uh, the best one. Okay? Very good. So this should be the slide on the literature review. Yeah. So we, this paper therefore is related to a number of things. Um, uh, in terms of the notions of communication and mediation, we are uh, using uh, precisely the notions of, uh, in that you can find in Forges and Myers and Papers. Um, the value of communication as added to the game without communication has also been covered in papers like uh, Sandeep and Thomas has one, has one, et cetera, where they don't deal with mediation, but it's, 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 so there is some relationship with that literature as well. Uh, and uh, the other two things are quite important. So the, as I said, there's one bullet here about what I just said before, namely uh, there is a debate on whether, on whether you, you want the mediator to be biased or unbiased, and here we are taking uh, simply one assumption that it's impartial, and, as, and I will try to argue at the end, or maybe in the question and answer, that this is the right way to go. Um, the the self-enforcing aspect is very important again, because we are trying to, to um, you know, consistent with my other work, to, to, uh, to acknowledge that that uh, difficulty of enforcing treaties. Uh, and so the, obviously, the, therefore, the papers that are most related in terms of, of, the, of how to solve it and so on are the papers on self-enforcing mechanism design, if you want. Uh, in Madison, Postel, White, Compton, JL are, are, are two recent papers. Um, finally, there is a enforcement counterpart, uh, Bester and Warner Reed have a paper that addressed, that tries to address similar question to ours, uh, but um, without the, the um, enforcement problem. And so at the end, we have a, we'll, we'll offer some uh, um, uh, conclusion on, on why, on, on, on whether this matters or not, okay? So modeling choices, how do we address all that? Um, we, we made the choice to stick to a canonical model in which war is due to, uh, to um, asymmetric information. Uh, of course, uh, as uh, uh, many people in this uh, audience and then myself with uh, Matt Jackson and so on, uh, there are lots of other uh, uh, reasons why, why bargaining fails and the inefficiency of bargaining and so on. And so, of course, one could ask then in a, in a in a sort of continuation of this research agenda, whether mediator has a comp mediators can have a completely different role when the real reason of war is commitment or some other stuff, um, uh, and it's not information. But here, let's stick to the simple case, simple canonical case in which you have a bilateral crisis in which uh, 
two players, two countries are have a claim on a on a fixed uh, uh, cake, which would be could be you know a territorial dispute, or could be uh, um, you know a, a dispute over rents from uh, from future extraction of natural resources or what have you, and there is a um, private information element, namely people can be hawks or dogs, um, which could refer to their strength, which could be private information, or it could be their resolve, their resolve or their intentions. Um, so that's a kind of canonical uh, situation in which uh, in which you have. Um, uh, it's one of the rationalist explanations of the world. Let, let's pick that, okay? And the, the second uh, modeling choice is that, like in uh, Sandeep's talk, we want to sort of characterize the upper bound of the role of mediation. So, uh, and we want to also compare it with the upper bound of what, of what uh, agents could do without a mediator. So therefore, we will allow for correlated play even when the mediator is not there. Obviously, correlated play, as, as Barry was also arguing before when we talked about difficulty of coordination, is not necessarily realistic, but by characterizing what the players could do, achieve uh, if they could correlate their play, you really got, get to, the, to their upper bound. And then we'll see under what conditions the, the fact that the mediator can correlate play directly can strictly, can strictly improve welfare. So the benchmark is public correlation. Exactly. Right? Okay. Exactly. So there's a coin toss then we do that. Exactly. So the public correlation will be compared. So, so therefore, another way to put it is that uh, the unmediated communication game is one in which communication is public, and the mediated communication game is like having uh, two uh, people in a marriage crisis going to talk separately to the uh, to the marriage counselor. No? And uh, and actually, interestingly enough. Um, uh, I've been told uh, that marriage <laughs> marriage counselors um, sometimes ask them ask them to talk directly to each other, and it's only when things get uh, get uh, difficult that they ask the, ask ask to have uh, private conversations with them, and that's some, is something that will be going on in the paper. Okay, and so the final modeling choice, as I said before, is that we will want to uh, impose ex post individual rationality constraints. Okay, so the preview of results. What we achieve in this paper is, number one, full characterization of the best uh, equilibrium that players could achieve with unmediated communication. Um, and this, as I said, will involve, uh, depending on the language you want to use, uh, correlated play or sunspots or other things. Um, then we ask, okay, with respect to that upper bound without the mediator, when and how does the presence of the mediator improve things? Obviously, the mediator could always decide to make the private messages he or she receives public. So therefore, he can always weekly do as much as, as well as the unmediated communication game. But he can do, in some cases, strictly better. And the question is exactly how and exactly when. And what kind of shape, what kind of you know, uh, quantitative estimate we can make of the role of mediator. When is the role of the mediator the strongest? We are interested in this because then, of course, at the qualitative level, we want to say under what circumstances that we can depict with variables that, that we can observe uh, should we advocate the intervention of a third party strongest, in the strongest you know, possible way? So that's kind of the, the qualitative question. Um, so the one thing that you will see in the paper is uh, related to two variables that, uh, in fact, have been um, used to, to, to talk about mediation also in the empirical uh, literature. So one is the cost or intensity of conflict, and the other one is the level of power asymmetry, um, uh, or which is kind of related, as we'll see in a minute, uh, to the level of hawkishness of, of, a, of, a, situa of, a, of a context. So, so the when basically is going to be uh, mediators are particularly useful 
when the conflict is expected to be costly or intense, and in fact, uh, at the same time, the level of hawk hawkishness is not very high. Uh, and on the other hand, when the, when the cost or intensity of conflict is, is, is lower, then in the, the role of the mediator is going to be important when the level of hawkishness or the level of power asymmetry is, are higher. So this, of, of course, will need to be explained in the, in the characterization. And um, after, now in the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about what kind of strategies the mediator uses that allow, uh, allow him or her to uh, obtain these type of things. Um, but the final point on this bullet is that, as I mentioned, uh, we were really motivated by, uh, uh, we, we thought it was very important to add this exposed individual rationality constraint. And indeed, it made the analysis very complicated. So, so it better be important for to go through all that algebra. But in, uh, surprisingly, uh, when at the end, when we got all the results, uh, we, we were able to prove that if you add enforcement and therefore you drop the exposed individual rationality constraint and you replace it with the interim individual rationality constraint like Bester Warner did do, you get exactly the same wealth. So we don't know yet, and here is where, you know, if, you, if, one of, if any of you reads the paper and uh, has an idea about uh, uh, a, a, a clearer intuition than what you offer right now for this, I, I, of course I offer one at the, at the end of the talk, but uh, it's, it's really um, uh, surprising, it was really surprising to us that at least in this context, of course I don't know how general this thing is, uh, the value of mediation is indeed in the communication strategies. But it is not, if you add enforcement, you cannot improve welfare further. So it's not only that we actually picked the pure mediation uh, as a benchmark because we wanted to get the, the, the essential, the minimum thing that you can do already with communication, but we achieve as a, as a byproduct that at least in this canonical model, enforcement wouldn't matter anyway. And so, it, and so the United Nations, uh, when they debate, uh, uh, you know, the, the, whether to send uh, uh, more or less, uh, you know, uh, peacekeeping troops, or whether to send them at all, or, or whether to try to, to have enforcement on, on top of, uh, on top of uh, negotiation facilitations, they're probably wasting their time, according to this model. What they should instead focus on is, is the appropriate situations in which, in fact, uh, unbiased mediators should be used in communicate for co purely for communication purposes. So just to be clear, exposed IR means if you knew the other guy's type, yes. you'd still no, it, follow the recommendation? It, it, it means that, what, that whatever you know, yeah. uh, um, if the recommendation is, for example, to settle, yeah. uh, but your expected utility, given what you know of going to war, uh, is higher than the proposed settlement, you, you, should, you should always be able to go to war because uh, in order to um, go to war, just one one decision of one player is enough. Okay. Whereas uh, the same uh, is not true for peace because P it takes yeah. two to time. Uh -huh. okay? okay, so it's a little bit asymmetric. Uh, uh, and there is no cost of arming here, so enforcement of an arms agreement or something like that. That's that's a different issue. Yeah. So no, no. Here, when I talk about enforcement, at the end, I will t I will simply. Uh, re re replace an ex post with an interim, which means, which means uh, uh, um, the um, the players once they agree to to uh, um, to accept the role of the mediator, they relinquish sovereignty. You know? So that's the, uh, so that's the only sense in which I will I will allow for enforcement at the end. So it's enforcement of the agreement itself uh, of, the of the agreement, of, of, yes, of the proposal of the mediator once you have accepted. So the, me, the mediator in that context becomes an arbitrator. Yes. Okay, so, so at the end there is this, this contrast. Okay. okay, so what slide am I on? Uh, so, the mediator strategies, yes. Yeah. So because I mentioned that the results are in terms of the when and the how. So these are the, this is the how. Um, basically, as in other... Uh, context, uh, people familiar with mechanism design uh, would already guess that um, 
that uh, the way in which the mediator achieves some strict uh, improvement is by, op by obfus op some kind of another of garbling or, or obfuscation strategy. So in particular, um, there are two things that are um, uh, th that happen uh, when when uh, the level of hawkishness in a in the in, in the situation, which means which means the probability with which uh, each player uh, thinks that the opponent is going to be hawkish, like high strength, high resolve, uh, you know, bad intentions or whatever. Um, so when when the when that level is is uh, is high, then uh, there is an incentive for the low types to mimic the the high types, uh, we, because in the absence of uh, of this obfusc obfuscation, which you don't have in the case of unmediated communication, um, that you know the, the benefit of of that. Um, uh, mimicking is that you can receive the higher uh, split, as you as I will show in a, in a minute, uh, the, the higher settlement uh, with respect to um, to what you would get if you if if uh, if you uh, said that you are a dove and the other one is a dove. So there is a there is a sort of uh, benefit of lying uh, related to the fact that if war doesn't occur, um, if war doesn't occur after your lie. You are going to get a better share. So there is a kind of a sort of peace payoff from lying. Now, without communication, sorry, without mediator, the only way to to um, uh, to reduce to reduce that incentive to lie, to eliminate it actually, to make things incentive compatible, is basically to have um, uh, the randomization device, the public randomization device, such that you actually have a higher probability of war. Uh, between hawks, so you basically punish, you basically punish the uh, the innocent in some sense. You, 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 sorry, you punish the liar by by sending him to war too many times. Whereas the mediator doesn't need to send him to war as many times because basically the mediator can already reduce the, um, the incentive to lie by um, by um, garbling the message after rec after receiving. The, the communication about the, the, the type, the, the self-declared types. So basically, if I'm, a, if I'm a dog and I say I'm a hog, now, the, since this message is now private, uh, I don't know what the other said, and the mediator can basically tell me, well, I still propose, I, I propose a split of 50-50. So now, since you see a proposal of 50-50, you say, well, now I'm not sure if the other said that is a dog and, 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 uh, or, or a hog. So basically, the fact that the mediator who receives message privately can still propose me an equal split, even though I, I lied on purpose to, to get some higher share. Now that, if you if you bring it back to the decision stage of whether to be truthful or not, uh, you know that reduces the incentives to lie without necessarily increasing the 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 the, um, the punishment in terms of war. So so therefore, in terms of the probability of peace that you re that you receive from the mechanism, this type of of confusion that, that the mediator uh, introduces is, is as a positive uh, value. And I will talk a, later a little bit about the other type of obfuscation that happens in the other parameter space. But basically, the bottom line is um, you don't really want, as a mediator, you don't really want to reveal to a self-declared hawk um, that the opponent is uh, a dove with probability 1. So you always want to leave some doubt in, uh, in, uh, in the head of a self-declared hawk that the other is a dog or not, there, because that reduces all these all this incentives to, uh, to lie without, without the punishments. Okay? So that's the general intuition I hope I am able to convey. So now we, sh we should be on the game without communication. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, after describing this, uh, after this and the next slide, I will get to the first of my two pictures that Sandeep helped me to put on the board. OK, so take the, this is the description of basically the canonical model that we use in our mediation story. So canonical stuff. So we have uh, <coughs> H and L are hawk and dove. Um, the, there is a cake, size one. Um, 
there is a shrinking of the cake that represents the potential cost of war. So if you go to war, the, sh the cake value shrinks to theta, otherwise it's one. Um, if you go to war and they are both hawks or both doves, the probability of winning is one half. If they go to war and one is hawk and the other is dove, the, the hawk has a probability of winning uh, of p greater than one half. So those are the standard parameters. And there is a fraction q of the population that is uh, hawks and one minus q is dove. So basically the, the three parameters, q, p, and theta describe the model. Now, uh, in terms of the game that would, go, would be going on without, um, without uh, uh, communication, all I want to convey is the idea that for war, it takes just one, per one player to decide it. For, to obtain peace, it takes two to tango. So the best way to, to summarize this is to say that for every split potential uh, settlement x, 1 minus x, uh, there is a war declaration game. Uh, imagine a word declaration subgame, where uh, again, if they both declare peace, then there is peace. But if if just one or or both, of course, uh, say war, then there is war. Therefore, uh, war is always one equilibrium of the word declaration game. And um, but of course, in uh, in uh, in some situations, even without communication, you would also have a peaceful equilibrium, and so. Now we'll, uh, we'll turn to, to, the, to the comparisons. The final bullet of this uh, uh, slide on the parameterization of the model says that uh, we, we need to assume p theta greater than 1 half for the following reason, that if the, if, the, if the cake shrinks so much, like theta is very low, or the probability of, of winning uh, for a hawk is, is, is very, very close to the, to the, the equal probability Anyway, so, that, so the value of being a hawk is not that big, then of course you wouldn't have a problem. So it, it would be kind of trivial. And so the only case in which, uh, in which we have uh, at, um, a, a potential problem is the case in which p theta is greater than 1 half, which is similar to, to the statement that I make with the, in the, the papers with Matt Jackson that the cost should not be overwhelmingly high. Okay? So now, there is the characterization of what happens without communication. And fortunately, we don't need to use all those three parameters, q, p, and theta. Uh, we, we can restrict the, the analysis uh, to two parameters. Uh, basically, this q, p, theta are uh, mapped into, into two parameters, lambda and gamma, which will allow us to characterize everything and have, and have uh, also pictures about what's going on. So it's just a convenience thing, but it, it also has some nice interpretation. So lambda, define first the definitions, like, uh, like before, better to have first the definitions, and then I'll move to the, to the intuition with pictures. So uh, lambda is simply the ratio, the odds ratio, basically. So it's q over 1 minus q. And so it, it plays the same role as, as, as having q, but, but it. Uh, the, the pictures are nicer if you reframe it that way. Uh, gamma is what we could call uh, the benefit cost ratio uh, for war for a, for a hawk, right? because the, only the hawk has, an inten has a potential incentive to attack. And so this benefit cost ratio that we need to worry about is just for the hawk. And so if you look at the numerator of gamma is p theta minus 1 half, that is basically the benefit for a, a, a hawk to go to war uh, conditional on facing a dove. So that's the, the benefit is, is basically when a hawk faces the dove. Uh, whereas the denominator is the cost, because if instead he's facing a hawk, then, then uh, it, the, the cost is really one half minus theta half, because if he, if he accepted peace, he would get one half, whereas by going to war, he gets theta half. Okay? So basically, that's the ratio of benefit cost for the hawk, depending on whether he's facing a, a dove or a hawk. And this P theta assumed to be bigger than a hawk? Yes, that's, that was the last bullet of, oh, okay, of the previous slide. Okay. okay, so this is the benefit cost ratio for the hawk. So, so notice that, again, uh, there is always a war equilibrium in the word declaration game, uh, but um, if the condition below here, so if q theta half plus 1 minus q p theta, which is the expected, the expected utility from going to war 
um, for a hawk when, when he doesn't have any other information or communication is less than or equal to one half, of course, there is also a peace equilibrium. Right? And, um, and this condition, in, in terms of those two variables that I've defined, translate, it, 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 it's, it's equivalent to say lambda greater than gamma. So if lambda greater than gamma, so if the frequency of hawks in the population is greater than the benefit cost ratio from going to war, then there, is always, there always exists a, a, a peaceful equilibrium as well. So even without communication, the best equilibrium would be peaceful. So here is therefore the first of the, the, the left uh, one of the two pictures that Sandeep helped me to, to write down um, uh, captures this, right? So in the <coughs> gamma or, or the benefit cost ratio for more is the x axis, the level of hawkishness or, or if you want this odds ratio, I don't know what, what the right word for this is, but anyway, the, 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 the frequency of hawks in the population is the, is the y axis. And, and if you look at the 45 degree line, that's the dividing line. So, so above <laughs> that, the best equilibrium is as peace. The above, below that, the best equilibrium as war. Well, the only. Equilibrium. Okay. So that's the that's what that's the the situation without communication. So now let's add communication. Unmediated one first, and then mediated will be last. So we are adding things one by one. So the game now is. Uh, now we have all the timing. So at time zero, the private types are realized. At uh, time one, they make messages. They basically tell each other publicly whether they are hawks or dogs. And, uh, and in, the, in the first part of the paper, we don't allow for mixing. But then there is a section in the paper where we allow for mixing. And if you, if you are interested, I can tell you what happens, but not, not much. Um, and, uh, and then, Basically, there is this correlated play step, which is the sort of unrealistic uh, <coughs> thing that, that, that I was re re referring to before. Namely, it is, it's really the best thing that in order to get to the best equilibrium, um, we need to have some randomization device uh, that uh, chooses a settlement uh, for every message pair and chooses a probability of war or, or, or offering that settlement again for every message pair. And so the, the, you can characterize the best equilibrium in that way. Of course, then you can decentralize it and, and talk about other, you know, other ways to, to, to implement it and so on. But it, it, all we were interested in is finding some way to characterize what's the best potential equilibrium without, with unmediated communication in order to compare it with the case, for example, that we already did without communication. And so obviously, with respect to that first picture that we put there, uh, the improvements are going to be below the 45 degree line because, of course, above the 45 degree line, uh, you can already assume that if you, since you are looking at best equilibria, that that we are we can already achieve that without communication. Okay, so what else I have here? Uh, well, and, and okay, that's it. And time three, there's the word declaration. Okay. So some definitions that relate to this time two. Uh, um, sort of characterization of, of, of what happens in the best equilibrium. So this is basically, um, you can think of it as, so how, how, how can we describe the best uh, separating equilibrium? So there will be, of course, incentive compatibility constraints in order to make sure that, in fact, we are <coughs> telling the truth. But um, given that, Given that uh, under those conditions they will tell the truth, um, the, the coordination that gives, that gives the players the best, uh, the best uh, welfare at the end involves potentially different settlement proposals for different, for different um, message pairs, namely given that they tell the truth, when they say that one is hawk, one is dove, naturally you can imagine that the optimal settlement B uh, could well be strictly greater than one half. So basically, the optimization uh, in order to find this best equilibrium is over this parameter B, which is the settlement in case they are, they are asymmetric. You can safely leave uh, 
the, the one half for the case in which they are, uh, they, they are uh, symmetric because the game is anonymous. And the, the other thing you're maximizing over is the, the probabilities with which the randomization device will make them coordinate on war or peace. Okay? So therefore, the, the notation uh, is going to be that if, for example, the pair of messages is HH, then the, um, the randomization device will tell them with probability PH to, uh, um, to uh, um, that the settlement is one half, one half, and then at that point they have to say accept or reject at the, at the word declaration stage. But with, with probability one minus PH, basically the, uh, the randomization device is telling them to coordinate on word. Okay? And so on and so forth with PM is the, it's for the asymmetric case and PL is for the low, low uh, messages. How much time do I have? You have uh, 14 minutes. Oh, wow. Okay, so I'll be, I'll be much quicker than I, okay. So, um, so this is the program, right? Yeah. yeah. So you're going to minimize the, the exact probability of war subject to the, exposed IR and IC star, so I don't have uh, much time to describe them in, uh, in detail, but basically um, the exposed IR constraints are very simple. You want B, so the, 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 the settlement proposal in case of, uh, of um, uh, asymmetric messages to be greater than P theta, because otherwise exposed, uh, even after receiving the, the nice offer B, the hawk would decide to go to war. And you want 1 minus b to be greater than 1 minus p theta, because otherwise the other one will not go to war. So therefore, b will have to be in, in, within some bounds. Okay? And, uh, and then you basically, the, the only thing intuitively that you need to bring home from the, from the IC star constraints, the first one is, is for low type, the second one is for, for high type, is basically that um, on the left-hand side of both incentive compatibility constraints, you have, you have the, the value of, of telling the truth. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have the value of line, which includes all these maxes. You see, on both sides, you have this, uh, you have, uh, on, on each uh, incentive compatibility constraint, you have, you have max between something and something. So all those maxes refer to the possibility that after you lie, you are still free once the, once the implication of your lie is that you get some settlement different from the one you would have received had you, told the, had you told the truth, you can still decide to go to war. So there is still there is consistency between having imposed ex post IR on the on the equilibrium path and what happens off the equilibrium path. Okay, that's the, the kind of general thing. So the proposition one. Now, of course, I don't have time to to go through the details, but let me tell you that for I have a slide on solution properties, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So. So at least I can tell you something about the formal, uh, formal result, not the full, I can't describe everything. But, uh, so the, um, the, the best equilibrium without the mediator um, has the following property. So, so start from the bottom. Uh, pH is more powerful than PM to deter, uh, to deter um, lies. So the idea is that uh, if you, so we, if you, uh, if the players want to reduce the incentive to lie for, for um, uh, DOS that want to exaggerate their strength, um, the, the most powerful tool is basically to, to uh, threat, to, to have a sort of implicit threat of, of high probability of war when they both declare hogs. Uh, then when, uh, then when, um, uh, then punishing the other way, also because uh, in, in some sense that way you punish two players instead of one. So I don't know if, I, if this is uh, too vague of an, intu of an intuition. And so because of that, all the characterization um, always has a, a pH greater than PM, the optimal, the best, the best equilibrium always has pH greater than PM, which is um, problematic for something, for interpretation, and I will talk about that uh, in the question and answer part. But uh, in any case, when you raise lambda, so when you raise the, the, the frequency of Hawks, uh, basically you can relax both pH and PM. You can punish less frequently uh, for lying um, and still get incentive compatibility. 
because by itself the, the, the environment is more hawkish, so there are more sort of statistical reasons to worry about lying because there are more hawks, true hawks out there, and so therefore you, you, you need less and less to punish with, with war when, 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 uh, when out of the, of the Bolivian path people declare to be, to be hawks. And so therefore this is sort of a, is a counter force um, a, a, that makes the probability of peace non-monotonic uh, in, uh, in, uh, the, in the hawkishness level of the environment because even though when the, statistically the fact that the environment becomes more hawkish has a direct effect on making you know probability of war higher but on the other hand the, the equilibrium they're playing involves less punishments uh, in order to keep incentive compatibility and this uh, at, in some intermediate level actually makes the, makes the probability of peace increase and then decrease again. So there is some non-monotonicity thing that, that characterizes. Uh, but anyway, that, that's the only sort of unexpected element at the intuitive level uh, that we get. The rest is, is basically, I mean, it's, it's interesting that we could fully solve quantitatively, but qualitatively the other things are, are intuitive. Okay, so uh, to summarize, this is the, the summary of the, what we have so far, right? Yeah. So to summarize, we have that you need the, uh, the frequency of hawks or the hawkishness level of the environment to be, to be uh, not, e not extremely high because otherwise you would solve, the, I mean, there would be peaceful equilibria even without communication. But, with, but uh, within that bottom part of figure one, uh, where you had war without communication, the optimal, um, uh, the optimal, um, Equilibrium with, without uh, without mediator uh, actually re reduces the space of, of there is a positive probability of war so it remains true that in that area there is a positive probability of war but that probability of war uh, mm -hmm. uh, as a strange shape which, so you have all the pictures in the in the paper strange shape that that is not really monotonic or it, it's, and it, there are three or four different areas so it's not completely so I, that's why I, pre I pre prefer to let you look at the three dimensional pictures on the paper rather than trying to mimic them myself. <laughs> okay. Although Mascolel used to do three-dimensional pictures in class, so I could have tried them. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is the mediator, yes? Yeah. So as I said at the beginning, the mediator, what, is the, what it does, uh, simply takes the messages privately, doesn't have to reveal what one player told him to the other player, and this allows him to uh, Basically, not not always be, in, in some sense, truthful in the in the in the revelation, or, or doesn't have to reveal anything. It simply receives these messages, and then proposes a settlement with some probability, and 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 with some other probability goes goes away and leaves the scene and lets them go to war. Okay, so it's good, so basically the way in which you can interpret the recommendation that with some probability will take place that they go to war is basically say, well, yeah. Uh, I'm leaving, this situation is too tough, I'm leaving, and then they, 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 they go to work. Okay. So, uh, do, uh, do I have time for the program? No, but one, one point, so here you have six ex post IR constraints instead of two. <laughs> and the, the idea is that, um, simply looking at the first one, if you want that for intuition, beta time something, okay. So, so the first one, for example, those six ex post IR is, <coughs> is the fact that if you are a hawk and you are offered the settlement beta, which is the better one, then uh, you have to compare that beta with, with your um, uh, expected utility, which involves some updating uh, from going to war. And that, that updating takes into account that that beta could, be, could have been proposed to you by the, <coughs> by the mediator uh, because the other one is truly a dog, or it could have been proposed to you uh, even though the other one is a hawk, no, not because you don't know exactly what, what uh, the, the um, because the mediator is allowed in principle in the program that you set up to uh, to offer even different splits, better one minus better, even when he sees equal messages, and he is free <coughs> to offer with some probability Q. Uh, um, the, 
they're equal split even when he sees asymmetric messages. So the fact that there is this freedom for the mediator to propose settlements that are not really uh, the, the you know, symmetry on symmetry and asymmetry on asymmetry, then you get a lot of ex post IR constraints to consider. So not surprisingly then, even the IC constraints are much more complicated and I skip them. So uh, instead of going through proposition two, Yes, so let me go to the intuitive part. Um, okay, result three? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so, so I just do it in words because there is no time to go to the formula, formalization. So, so, the, um, so basically, in, uh, when looking at, uh, at um, the when question, what you could do in figure one, <coughs> I didn't ask Sandeep to do it because uh, it, it, it's complicated, but you can, I, I can easily um, uh, at least talk you through this. So in figure one, you can basically divide the, the bottom part where you have problems with work into two parts by a sort of ver vertical bar. Um, and, and so divide the space between high gamma and low gamma situations, where, where high gamma means high benefit cost ratios, which means low expected cost intensity of work, and, 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 uh, and low gamma means low benefit cost ratio, or if you wish, high cost intensity of work. So in the two, in the two regions, what's going on uh, is slightly different. When, when you are uh, in the sort of right, right uh, region where you have gamma is high, the benefit cost ratio are, uh, is high, um, there what happens is that the, the key, um, the key problem is to eliminate the incentive to, exa to exaggerate strength that dogs have. And there, the nice strategy that I mentioned before by the mediator is to uh, confuse the self-declared hawk by offering one half, one half with positive probability. And that's, that, that's, the, that's basically the key thing that uh, 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 allows, uh, allows him to, uh, to, to do well there. Whereas when the, when the benefit cost ratio is low or, or the cost intensity is high, um, <coughs> the, um, the, the other problem, hiding strength, is the, is the, is the binding uh, constraint that to worry about. So and, and there, I haven't told you the intuition for why in this model there is also an incentive to hide strength. Basically, uh, remember what I told you before, that the, the best equilibrium with and without mediator involves some punishment. Namely, if, you, if you're a self-declared hawk, uh, with some probability you are sent to war even, without, even with, against the hawk, because that's the way, that's the way you, keep, uh, you keep the incentive constraint uh, um, satisfied. But now, uh, because of that, if you, are a, if you are a hawk, you might want to lie and hide your strength. So there, th that way you, you kind of dodge the bullet of this punishment. And then, in the, in the separating equilibrium, once you realize that the other guy is a dog, there you attack. Because you have exposed IR, right? So basically the, the hawk can pretend to be a dog, hide strength, and then attack later anyway if he realizes that the other one is a dog. So in the, in the IR literature, this hiding strength uh, uh, possibility is, is, is described uh, a little bit less frequently than the exaggerating strength possibility, but, it, but it's there in many cases. So, so that possibility is there, and now the, the mediator again can improve with respect to our mediated communication, um, in the following way that is described in words here in result four. Um, so basically, he needs to offer the unequal split, beta one minus beta, with some probability, even when the messages are both dot. Okay? So even, if, even when, they, when they both uh, self-declare to be, to be dovish, uh, with some probability, he's going to tell one, one of them, your settlement is beta and your settlement is one minus beta. Now, that, now tell me if you accept or reject. And, um, and that way, uh, the, the, the one who, the, the hawk who hide, decided to hide strength, if, if, the, if the hawk decides to hide strength in order then to attack a dog, now he's no longer sure in, in that continuation game whether he's really facing a dog there is some probability that the other is actually a hawk because of this confusion in the settlement stage. And therefore, the value overall of lying goes down. And again, the mediator achieves this disincentive 
without necessarily punishing as much as in the unmediated case. Okay? So both the exaggerating strength and the hiding strength incentives are kept in, in check in, in two different parameter, parameter spaces uh, with, with uh, basically confusing the hawk on, on with, with settlements that are equal split when they shouldn't or unequal split when they should. Okay, different, different things. So the final point, uh, so here's a slide on enforcement. Yeah. As I said, um, there's this paper that is, is a little bit different, but you can rewrite you can rewrite the Bester Warner paper in our terminologies. That's what we do in our section four, whatever. And, and, and replacing the ex post IR with the interim <coughs> IR, which basically has the interpretation that, as I said, it's arbitration. Right? So that if you, 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 if you accept the mediator, then you will accept whatever he tells you. Yeah. And so we were expecting that, that there should be some uh, further strict improvement, but the answer uh, is no, there is no improvement, and I don't have time to, to go through the, uh, this particular step. But you know, rather than going through this enforcement result, I want to use my last uh, minute or two yeah. to describe the last picture. Because this tells you, in a nutshell, um, <laughs> and in the parameter range in which, uh, in which um, mediator, mediation helps the most, uh, what's going on. Uh, at least gives you a picture of it quantitatively. So, so this, is, this picture, this second picture that we have there, um, is uh, drawn for a particular value of gamma. So, so, so fix the benefit cost ratio um, for, of, from going to war for the hawk. So the technology, you know, it's, it's a function of P and theta. So fi fix the probability of winning for the hawk and fix the cost of war. Fixing P and theta, you're fixing gamma. And so that goes out of the picture. And now look at how does the probability of peace on the y-axis depend on the level of hawkishness of the environment in the three cases, okay? Uh, and remember that I'm drawing the, the picture between one value and another of hawkishness because once you go beyond the second, once you go beyond the, to the right, you are already in the, in the, in the space in which uh, in which peace could be obtained even without communication, okay? And if the level of hawkishness is too low, to the, to the left of where the curves, the curves are, there basically there is not much difference between unmediated and mediated communication, which is captured by the fact that the mediation versus unmediation curve starts at the same point. So that is supposed to mean that what happens to the left of that is, is, is the same for mediation and non-mediation. Okay, so, but uh, that is less interesting than what happens in that range. So, so there is a range of, of values of, uh, of hawkishness of the environment, such that the picture is, like, is, is exactly the one you see, namely the probability of peace without communication is pretty low and decreasing. So the, the probability of peace um, <coughs> decreases with the level of hawkishness of the environment up to the point where you reach the stage in which there exists a, a, a peace equilibrium even without communication, and there you have a jump, this continuous jump in the probability of peace and goes to one. Um, the, the unmediated communication, because of the punishment that the correlated play allows players to achieve, um, is, is higher, obviously. It goes from three quarters to, to two quarters. So it, it's higher than that, but it's still decreasing because, once again, uh, what prevails, uh, the, the dominant effect remains that as you increase the hawkishness level of the environment, um, you, uh, the probability of peace has to go down because not only the environment is, is more hostile, uh, but on top of that, you still need to punish the, um, the deviations uh, heavily, and so you, get, you, get, uh, you, you can't fully, fully compensate for the statistical uh, worsening of the environment. Whereas the final, the final, the top curve that tells you what the mediator achieves, tells you that, um, Actually, the mediator makes the probability of peace increase with the level of hawkishness of the environment. Why? Because as the environment becomes uh, more and more hawkish, the, the cost of, um, of, uh, of, um, of being drawn into, into an, un, an unwanted war, basically, is, is, is uh, much more likely to be incurred and so the, basically the, the, the obfuscation message 
to, to avoid the exaggeration of strength that I described before becomes extremely effective. And si since that becomes extremely effective, you, you can reduce the, the punishments substantially. And so the, the commitment problem that the mediator has to, to impose this, uh, this optical even buff work becomes much smaller. And, and you obtain that, therefore, the probability of peace is increasing in the level of consciousness, and, it, and it's actually continuous. Okay. Done, done. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> so the floor is open. Questions? Okay, so I have one quick one, if I make one, it might be tricky. So I got the intuition for uh, why the weak guy who does might want to pretend to be a hawk exaggerate his strength, and how you can alleviate that through mediation, OK? But then you have the second part, where the hawk wants to pretend to be a dove, you alleviate that a different way. How does that map into this diagram? Because this diagram, as far as I just no, the second one is not in this diagram. The second one's not in this diagram. No, so okay. we would need another diagram that covers what we've left. So I, I, I explicitly is that the third dimension? Because as I mentioned, no, no, no. It's 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 because basically the the other the elimination of hiding strength uh, incentive is relevant. Uh, so if you look at the first picture, yeah. picture one, mm -hmm. is relevant in the bottom left corner. Okay. So with, with low gamma and low lambda. Okay. Okay. Below the 45 what, degree. Uh, yes, low gamma, low lambda. Below the 45 degree. Uh, uh, why, why is that? Because in that range, since there are not so many hawks, mm -hmm. um, uh, so there are not so many hawks, then by... Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit complicated to, to describe. Uh, um, yes, so, so the... Uh, yes, yeah, okay, yes, sorry, 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 okay. Okay. So because there are not so many hawks, then if you lie and you are and, and if you are a hawk and you lie and you, and you, pre and you hide strength, you pretend to be a dog, yeah. the probability that you're actually meeting a true hawk is not that much. Yeah. So you're not worried about that. Yeah. And you can dodge the bullet of the punishment of, of the HH case. Yes. And then you can attack exposed. Uh, okay. okay? Mm -hmm. So that's, that, and that's what you, you can avoid by gargling on the other direction. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, Clara Ponsani and some of the people she's worked with have, have done something on what they call filtered communication, and it seems to be related to this, but I can't quite. Yeah. Uh, the, the idea is that, pe is that the, the, each one says what they'll accept to the mediator, and the mediator doesn't report it to the other party until the two cross. So from my knowledge of, I, I might not have read everything that Clara wrote, but, but she, so she was our discussant uh, in Madrid, and, um, and, um, and then I talked to her a little bit uh, afterwards. But from, from what I understood, what, what you just said refers more to the Bester Warnery paper than to ours. Namely, their, their work is mostly an arbitration uh, stuff. But I, I, haven't paid, I haven't paid the right tribute to it. I haven't made the right comparisons yet in the, in the paper. So, so it's not, it's a, it's a per, the person is being a mediator, not an arbitrator. They're not in, enforcing anything. But they no. simply listen to each side. And if the two sides have, uh, have one side makes a proposal and the mediator doesn't pass it on to the other side until the two proposals are mutually compatible. Uh -huh. In other words, it's a way of kind of, if you, your filtering happens by obfuscating somebody who says I'm a hawk or a dove. Uh -huh. uh, her way is by simply not passing the proposal along to the other person, not even mm -hmm. uh, telling the other person what the first party said mm -hmm. until, they're, until they, uh, until an agreement has been made, in which case, help. Right. So, I, 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 again, I haven't read that particular paper, but my sense is that, or our, our sense, I should say, is, is that certainly you could do other things by letting, by letting um, players do multiple rounds or by mm -hmm. filtering different ways. You, know, you could do other things. This is uh, the comparison between the best they can do with one shot 
um, direct communication and the best they can do through one shot communication with the mediator. Everything else on what could happen if, uh, if they talk again and so on is, 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 uh, is open for future research. No, 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 but by the revelation principle, yeah. you know, one shot communication is that logical actuality in the mediated case. In the mediated case, yes. So you could have many rounds or whatever, but anything that, you know, you could Right, no, no, in the mediated, no, the yeah. Other, absolutely, yeah. yeah, in the mediated case. So he's talking about a mediated case, so it sounds like she's looking at a particular mechanism. So yes. we... And this is looking at the optimal. We, so the, the point is this, we didn't know exactly what uh, what to think about the relation principle because of, uh, of this exposed IR and so on, but especially after seeing that, <coughs> that the welfare is exactly the same as in the best and ordinary, where for sure the relation principle applies, yeah. no? And given that that uh, ours has a, an even stricter constraint because it's exposed instead of interim, right. then 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 now now we know that the relation principle applies, yeah. and so therefore the mediated game is fine. I don't think uh, I should worry about that. But what could happen is that, you know, in the talk I said that maybe the best equilibrium <coughs> with unmediated communication. The best realistic equilibrium is worse than what than what that middle curve g tells you, because of because it's more difficult without the mediator to correlate play. But what you are saying, what what I thought you were saying, but maybe, maybe uh, you know, uh, or what comes to mind when you uh, listening to that, would that would be that well in the unmediated case, where where in fact um, uh, it, it, it doesn't the relation principle doesn't apply. Uh, there could be other things that could be even better. In fact, there is a section in the paper where we say, let's allow for mixing. So it's not no longer just uh, tell the truth or not uh, in, a, in a zero one case, uh, but allow for mixing at the, at the message stage. And, you, and there is indeed a region of the parameters where you can do slightly better. And so you can, also, you can probably do even better with some multiple rounds of, of negotiations. What we couldn't prove, uh, and I don't know if it's, um, if it's interesting or not, it, we couldn't prove yet, but we have a conjecture that even if you allow for all kinds of multiple rounds of, of uh, negotiation that you want, the upper bound of the welfare is, ne is, is never um, the same as the mediated one on the, whole, on the whole parameter range. And all we need to prove this uh, is to complete one example, basically. Just can give one example where there is the difference yeah. between two. Let's take the question from Robert and break for lunch. Okay, well, I, I was a little bit, I was trying to figure out a mediator, a real life mediator that would correspond to this particular mediator. And in one particular dimension, I'm really having trouble uh, doing that. So I was a little bit worried about that. Uh, because there, you assume that there's no commitment problem at all for the mediator. So the mediator can announce an optimal plan for instance, if I get these two messages, then I'm going to recommend that both of you go to war. Mm -hmm. And I'm having a little bit of trouble thinking of an actual mediator that could credibly commit ahead of time to saying, okay, you know, if I if this should happen, even though it might be optimal, but obviously there's a risk. Mm -hmm. No, so I, I I agree that there is a commitment issue, but it's not just for the mediator. It's also for the unmediated communication stage, so because the, the I, I, even though they might agree ex ante that um, that uh, the probability th that having those randomization uh, formulas, whatever, is is best in terms of expected welfare, uh, if, given that it is a separating equilibrium, after all, you might still say, why don't they renegotiate? Uh, after they see that they are both, <laughs> both hawks or both doves, okay? So the problem of renegotiation proofness is not a problem of the mediator. It's a problem of both the unmediated and the mediator communication and the mediated case. And so if we had a, 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 a workable notion of renegotiation proofness with asymmetric information, which we don't, uh, then we could try to, to, uh, to check whether the qualitative difference between unmediated and mediated communication the mediator goes through even when you impose that renegotiation proofness that you refer to. Uh, but the problem is that when you use the, the ready-made notions that are not many that we know of, 
so for example, the notion of negotiation proofness in, in forges, in Fluas forges work, uh, you get a non-existence, uh, you, you get a non-existence problem, so it's not really workable. And the idea why you can't really solve the model with the negotiation proof is estimating information, many people have played with this, um, is that in order to be um, uh, fully renegotiation proof, you would need the you would need the, um, the the recommendation to go to war to be followed by war with probability one, but that is but that is inconsistent with what you said, is 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 difficult to to achieve. So I, I, we have a, we have added uh, not in the version you you have on the website, but we have added now a, a long paragraph on on this. And of course, it would be nice to to deal with this because, as as, as you said, um, I can only imagine that um, that one way in which the mediator can uh, can achieve the coordination of going to war or making them go to war once they lie is basically to leave the scene and say, well, you know, I give up. This is not working, and so on. And then and then they get the message that. But, uh, but how, you know, but why should you do that? Like the commitment problem that you raised is, is a serious one. If I had to make my own guess, kind of very vague guess, uh, I would say that it's a little bit uh, easier to, to achieve that commitment for a mediator, actually, than for players to achieve that commitment by themselves. So in terms of the relative comparison that I'm interested, with, interested in between what you can achieve with and without the mediator, uh, my guess is that the, the, if you introduce this commitment problem in some way formally that you can solve it, you will see at the end that if anything, the, it's, the, the difference is going to increase. So I don't believe that the mediator has more commitment problems than the, play, than the players. But that's, uh, that's so far it's conjecture. Okay, thank you very much.